today. That's why the devil is defeated. And I want to read a prophetic psalm. Psalms 22 is a prophetic word that was written by David about Jesus. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? My God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. And in the night season, and I'm and I'm not silent. But you are wholly enthroned in the praise of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted in you, and you delivered them. They cried to you, and you were delivered, and were delivered. They trusted in you, and were not ashamed. But I am a worm, and no man, a reproach of man, despised by the people. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, He trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let her deliver him, from, since he delights in him. For ye, you are he who took me out of the womb. You made me trust while on my mother's breast. I was cast upon you from birth from my mother's womb. You have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouths. Like a raging and roaring lion, I'm poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far from me. O my strength, hasten to help me. Deliver me from the sword. Amen. Father, thank you this morning for your precious Holy Spirit. Touch us in a powerful way. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I think the clearest picture that we get of the gospel timeline is through the Jews. I also think the clearest picture that we get of the prophecy timeline is through the Jewish people. And specifically the Jewish feasts. The feasts represent the timeline not only for the Jewish feasts, but for the coming of Messiah and all that he did, and then for the coming of the end with Antichrist. So if you want to know what God's timeline is, study the Jewish feasts. And let me just talk to you about a few of them. One of them is the feast of Passover. Everybody here heard about Passover? The word Passover, God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. He sent the death angel to do what? To come across the land of Egypt and everybody that didn't have the blood of a lamb that was slain in their house over the blood, over the doorpost, the lintel of their doorpost, they were killed instantly by the death angel of Egypt. That Passover was to continue. God said it's going to be a remembrance, an inheritance for you. It's going to be a commemorative thing. You're going to keep a feast day called the Passover. And every year around the 14th of Nisan, which was March, the Jews kept the feast of Passover and they would kill a lamb. They would even run the spits through the lamb in the form of a cross. The lamb had to be perfect without blemish and they would eat of the meat and uh, keep the Passover because they were not to forget that it was by the shedding of that sacrificial lamb that they had been spared from the death angel. And then we find that Jesus comes and is killed on what feast day? You guessed it, Passover. The very day that the Jews have celebrated, not only when they got their temple did they keep Passover in their house, but they kept Passover at the temple. And they were to not only kill a lamb and eat it in their house, but they were to bring another lamb and go to Jerusalem and worship God and to give that lamb as a sacrifice for their family. So every year around the 14th of Nisan, they would go and they would keep the Passover. And as they would go into the temple, there would be as many as 150,000 people that would flood into Jerusalem and every inn was full. They camped outside the city walls. They had tents. They, 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 it was just crowded over with people. And there it was the most holy time for Israel because they would commemorate when God spared Israel in the land of Egypt as slaves. And they would bring a lamb. And that lamb on Passover day 
would be killed within a two hour time frame. And it started on the 14th of Nisan, Passover day. They would bring it to the temple and the priest would slit its throat at three o'clock. Three o'clock was the death hour when they killed and they had a two hour window to kill those lambs. And they would kill as many as 150,000 lambs within a two hour period. They would take the blood and they would slit the throat and they would take the blood and drain it out of the throat and they would pass it in a little, in a little container, a little basin, and they would pass it like men pass water for, for fire. And they would pass it to the next, the next, the next, and finally it got to the last priest and he would splash that blood over the altar of the Lord at the temple at Jerusalem. And this was the procedure that they used. Not only was there Passover, but three days later there was called the Feast of First Fruits. Israel kept that for over 2,000 years as a feast day. Not only did they celebrate the Passover, but the fact that they got out of bondage, now they were able to plant crops and have a harvest. And the first shootings that came out of the ground, they pulled those out, they went to the temple three days later, and they celebrated the Feast of First Fruits. Fifty days after First Fruits, they celebrated the, 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 the celebration and the feast day of Pentecost. And there was the celebration that the grand harvest had started. And they would take the corners of the fields and bring the grain in. And they would have a huge celebration that would last for a week. And they would celebrate that the harvest has begun. Then from the Feast of Pentecost to the Feast of Trumpets was the longest period of time between any of the Jewish feasts. It was four to four and a half months. And then they had no feast for four months because the harvest had begun. Then the Feast of Trumpets was signaling that the end of the harvest has come. It's time for the Jew to go and to worship God and to thank God for the harvest. It was an indeterminate time. They didn't know exactly when it was going to be, but they celebrated it when they the priest blew the horn from the parapet wall of the temple and the Jew is out there working in the fields as fast as he can. Right beside him on another row is an Arab and they're working side by side but they hear the horn sound and the Jew knows it's the Feast of Trumpets. It's time to celebrate. The harvest is over. We're going to go to the temple and we're going to worship God. He'd pick up his sack of grain and he would head up to the temple. The Arab would hear the sound, look around, keep working. He didn't care. He wasn't in covenant. He didn't know what that feast day meant. This is a picture of the church. This is a picture that after Jesus died, he was raised three days later on what? The feast of first fruits. But Paul said he is the first fruits of those who were to come. Every one of us have also been raised because Jesus was raised on the feast of first fruits. Fifty days later, Pentecost means fifty. Fifty days later, they celebrate celebrated the beginning of the harvest. When they celebrated the beginning of the harvest, <clears throat> the Holy Spirit fell and started the harvest of the church. On the feast day of Pentecost, when there's 150,000 people in Jerusalem, God starts the church. It lasts for four months. What is the four months of the church? It's over 2,000 years since Pentecost started, and now we've had 2,000 years, the longest period of time. What's going to stop it all. The feast of trumpets. The trumpet of the Lord shall sound. The dead shall be raised. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet him in the clouds and so shall be ever be with the Lord. And an indeterminate time, never quite known what day or hour, but you're supposed to be watching and be ready. You see seasons and times, but you don't know days or hours, but you know that he is ready to come back. When the trumpet sounds, the the harvest is over for the church. The church goes up to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. What does the Arab do? The Arab keeps working in the fields. Why? He misses the coming of the Lord. Why? He's not going to worship Christ but Antichrist. What's going to trigger Antichrist? The coming of Jesus Christ. And when the rapture takes place, millions and billions of people gone, this world is going to be in utter chaos and anarchy. But but a man will arise with all the answers. He will come with a diabolical scheme.
scheme and a surreptitious hand and by seduction he will subdue the world and take the reins of power. We already know the computer mark will be in the right hand of the forehead and we know that no man will buy or sell without that computer mark. We know that the Arab is represented by the world and they will gladly worship Antichrist. In fact, the spirit of Antichrist is already in the world today. When they talk about Christians in Washington, D.C. and the government, they talk about us as being fanatical and dangerous and a group that's extreme. Christians, oh, they're terrible. They're radical and extreme. They're right. They're going to get rid of us. One of these days, Jesus is going to come and we're going to be gone in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Somebody say amen. We're not going to be here. I said all that to set up my sermon. Because I'm not preaching on any of these feast days. I'm just giving you that as an illustration to start with. But I want to preach about what Jesus did for us. It is a crying shame that in America, the church that bears the name of Jesus is ashamed of the one they're supposed to serve. That is a shame. Ashamed of his name. Won't even use his name. Ashamed of his symbols, the cross. Ashamed of what he preached and what he stood for. They deny the very God they're supposed to be serving. And I think, I heard, you know, even prejudice against communion. A preacher friend of mine told me one time, he said, oh, I always take that communion. I don't have it maybe once a year. I get sick of it. Communion. I wanted to slap him. I felt the spirit of slap come on me. <laughs> oh, what's wrong with you, stupid? You get tired of communion, putting communion together? You're so lazy you don't want to pour grape juice in a glass? Serve the people communion? It's one of the few things we have to remember who Jesus is and what he did. Jesus said, do this as often as you do in remembrance of me. What's wrong with you? There's an antichrist spirit in the world, even in the churches. They don't want to have communion. But I want to share with you out of this book today, I'm going to read to you about a chapter out of this book. It's called Killing Jesus. It's by a man named Stephen Mansfield. He's a New York Times bestselling author. And I saw him interviewed on 700 Club. I ordered his book and it has absolutely put a fire in my soul. This man did extensive, extensive research in what it was really like for Jesus to die, what it was like the day he took the beating and the day he took the scourging and the day he took the cross. And I'm going to share with you what he has to say about it. But before I do that, I just want to set it up by saying that God loves us so much. See, we were His by right of creation. And He put us in the most beautiful environment that is known on the planet, the Garden of Eden. And He gave us fruit to eat and blessings. He made woman for man. They lived in a perfect environment. They had healthy bodies. They were never going to get sick. There was only one thing that God put a tree in the middle of the garden and said, don't eat of the fruit of that tree. The day you eat it, you will die. Now, God is not capricious or mean. God is good. He gave them everything. He said, "All oh, everything here is yours. It's yours. You got it all except for one thing. Why one thing? I have to know if you're going to be loyal to me. Somebody say amen. amen. See, Brenda put this ring on my finger 40 years ago. The October the 1st, it would be 40 years we've been married. Somebody say amen. amen. My brother-in-law, Denny. My brother-in-law said, man, 40 years, you don't even get that for murder. <laughs> but you know what? You can do anything you want to except for this. Oh, you put that on. That's a sign of covenant. Without that, you got nothing. Without the tree and the garden, 
God didn't have anything with them. He didn't have a relationship. Until somebody chooses to love you and to serve you, you don't have anything. Until people choose to serve God, they don't have anything. And God doesn't have anything. God didn't want wind up dolls that walked around saying, Praise God, 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 praise God. God wanted real people with real minds, real wills that would choose Him. And so He put that tree there and said, You have everything except for this one thing, and by this, You'll show your loyalty and your love to me. And Adam and Eve said, okay, okay. And they were fine with it. You know, the the commandments of the Lord are not grievous. Jesus said, come to me. I'm meek and lowly. My burden is light. People act like it's hard to serve God. I get tired of Christians. Well, I'm just holding on. I just pray, God, I can make it another week. Come on. I tell you who's barely holding on. Those people out here in the bars this morning. The people out here that don't have Jesus, that's who's barely holy. That's who's oppressed. That's who's suicidal. That's who's not going to make it. You've got the living God on the inside of you. You've got Jesus as your companion. You've got heaven as an inheritance. You've got angels that watch over you. And you're telling me, oh, I just hold it on. You ought to be skipping your heels together. You ought to be shouting the victory this morning. Come on, somebody say amen. Paul called his trouble light affliction. And we can't even call ours affliction. And Adam and Eve in the garden were responsible for just one thing. And that was to submit to God's word regarding that one tree. But Satan entered into the world and walked into that, slithering into that garden. I don't know if he was slithering then or not. But he began his dialogue by bringing God's word into question and then contradicting it. Completely, this caused Eve to begin to think, think. Eve began to think. That's your trouble. You start thinking outside of this book. You start thinking that you're you're God. You're the captain of your own destiny. You can do it all. You start thinking outside of what God said. She began to think she could have a meaningful and proper understanding of life apart from God's Word. Now she was free to examine what God had to say independently and on her own determine truth against the conflicting argument of Satan. She set aside God's Word in order to become her own primary authority in the world of thought. Specifically, she abandoned loyalty to her Creator so to make herself His equal determining good and evil for herself. Somebody say amen. As a result, she plunged the whole human race into lawlessness and the resulting chaos of death that it has brought through these thousands of years. Somebody say amen for that. I'm telling you, it didn't work and it still doesn't work today. We want to serve the Lord. And be obedient to him. Somebody say amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So what did God do? Eve said a resounding, I don't want you. I'm as good as you. I'll be my own God. I'll determine what's right and wrong. Thank you. I don't want you, God. So what did God do? He made a promise. In the third chapter, in the 15th verse... I'm going to provide for you anyway. What would most of us do if somebody stuck their tongue out and said, I don't want you? We'd walk off. But God bought us back again. Somebody say amen. Amen. Hallelujah. He bought us back again. And he bought us with his own son. Hallelujah. And he sent his son and said, something has to be done. I love them so much. I want to buy them back again. And uh, we want to, I want to read to you today some things about crucifixion, first of all. If you can just show the first slide, it'll be fine. We'll just read to you a little bit about what crucifixion was. 
It is not certain, the author says, whether the practice began with the Persians or like much else in the world, the Phoenicians, the Assyrians. Each had their own version of it. Once Alexander the Great saw its power, he used it to horrifying effect. Thousands were crucified at his command. It was Alexander, in turn, who introduced crucifixion 